So I think uh, you kind of hit upon uh, most of these uh, reasons uh, that I personally feel why there is uh, a huge opportunity for Android in the F&B sector. You obviously have a strong, uh, a huge potential for supply and demand gap, right? I mean, there are still a lot of, uh, if you look at uh, the consumerism in the country, um, obviously there is uh, a lot more uh, demand than what the supply can take care of. So that itself, at the macro level, is a huge opportunity. When it comes to the other three items, technology is helping convenience, it's giving a lot more variety, and also finally uh, affordability. And I'll touch upon the last point as well. Uh, just uh, to give you a context, uh, Drop Cafe is uh, uh, India's first online coffee shop. So we uh, essentially are virtual cafe coffee day or Starbucks, right? I mean, you place an order, we deliver coffee. And uh, you, may, you may wonder why there's a need for such a thing, right? Uh, several reasons, right? We, uh, we did a lot of uh, primary market research uh, on the primary value proposition, which is if you get fresh, uh, freshly brewed awesome coffee delivered to your doorstep or your desk in case in your office setting, would you be interested? So we just, it's it just a simple value proposition, simple question. We ran that marketing uh, campaign for a couple of weeks and we got a few thousand people across Bangalore who said, look, my office coffee sucks and I will sign up for it. So that's really, you know, a small value proposition that we kind of, uh, uh, it's solving our own pain to be honest. We always struggle uh, in, in uh, our own uh, office for good coffee, we all we all actually had to hire somebody to make five or six coffee runs every day. So you know all kinds of things, right? So it's a, it's a simple value proposition, but also the fact that uh, uh, the affordability. Now we have uh, more than a few thousand customers in the last two months since we launched. And uh, the most exciting thing is there are first time consumers of non-filter coffee because of Drop Cafe. So people are trying different kinds of coffee. We have seven to eight kinds of coffee uh, on our daily menu. So people are embracing the whole coffee thing. You know, earlier people were just drinking filter coffee. I mean, in this part of the world, people just you know take it for granted that's only coffee. So we are actually doing uh, cafe lattes, Americanos, specialty coffees, for almost the same price. So by going internet first, by going uh, uh, leveraging technology, we just don't have the cost of uh, something like a cafe coffee day or any other cafe for that example. So we are driving down the cost of essentially the product to such an extent that we are onboarding a completely new consumer uh, segment that is otherwise not uh, thriving or you know capable of using the offline alternatives. So the whole affordability element, and uh, there is a reason why uh, food tech is as a space uh, you know, is super exciting at the moment where investors are throwing money like crazy. In 2014, to put it in context, uh, a billion dollars were invested in the US just in this space. 2013 was like 50 million dollars. So in one year, it was like almost 20 times uh, investment in the space. The reason for that is there's a huge unbundling that's happening. And I'll, I'll just touch upon uh, so, uh, I, I think this is a very broad uh, spectrum of investment that you say that 1 billion is invested in the space. Yeah. So, the, so this is the spectrum. Oh, I don't know if you, can, if you guys can see it, but that's the spectrum. So there are different uh, uh, components, right? You got uh, traditional, can you guys read it or I'll just uh, kind of give you the at least the size of the quarters. You have the uh, traditional restaurants here on the left hand side that kind of move on to the, uh, the fast casual segment, um, you know, the likes of uh, a bunch of them essentially making it uh, more convenient for our customers. Then the full 2.0 is that uh, top right quarter, right? Where you have companies like Sprint, Manchuri, Spoon Rocket, the, uh, the likes of um, uh, I don't know if you've heard of uh, the US companies, but Seamless and all these companies who basically are in the, in the Bangalore context as Swiggy or uh, Food Panda or Just Eat. Essentially, aggregators who are just picking up the food from the restaurants and deliver it to you in the most convenient way possible because restaurants uh, traditionally don't have that muscle. I mean, they don't invest in obviously either the technology or the logistics of it. So there is uh, a segment that got created where uh, how can I partner with restaurants to use technology, to use last mile logistics uh, competencies to get the food to the customer uh, in the most convenient way, in the most quickest way. <coughs> so that's uh, that's the second way you see the Manchuris, uh, Spoon Rockets, uh, uh, you know, all, the, all these people. Then we got uh, companies who decided, look, I think uh, there is no reason for me to depend on a restaurant. Why can't I just make a virtual restaurant, which is only meant for delivery, or I can drive down the cost, as I was saying earlier, like in the case of Drop Cafe, if I do coffee just like what the way we do, 
we don't have any, uh, you know, we don't have storefronts. You can be anywhere in the sense because I'm not attracting customers to my shop. It's only meant for uh, fulfillment. It's only meant for production and uh, essentially taking care of the logistics and uh, you know uh, delivering the, uh, the final product to the customers. So there are a bunch of companies that uh, came in 2014. Even in the US, it's very really relatively very really new. Who are saying I can experiment with the food much more and I can invest in the product much heavier than a traditional uh, F&B player because for me. All the investment that I'm going to do is in two areas. One is on the product itself, the food itself, and the second is how do I get it to the customer. So uh, that's where uh, a lot of innovation is happening. And there are other uh, companies that are truly food tech. In my opinion, even Drop Cafe, I would say it's not food tech. Uh, Swiggy, Drop Cafe, or uh, Fresh Menu, or any of these companies, uh, you mentioned a few names. There are 250 odd companies uh, in India at the moment uh, that came in the last uh, six months in the food tech uh, space. I would consider them as technology and food companies. So when you say food tech, there are companies uh, uh, such as uh, Hampton Greek uh, Foods, which is an uh, uh, investment of uh, you know, Tosla, where you are fundamentally changing the behaviors of the customers or the, food, uh, the ingredients of the food itself. Uh, for example, this Hampton Greek is a great case study because they went on to create uh, essentially uh, uh, mayo, premise, which is uh, non-egg based, using uh, vegetable, uh, oils and all that, because that's a huge issue in the U.S. where you know the obesity is a big problem, fat, uh, you know, uh, unsaturated fats uh, is a big issue. So they are fundamentally changing how the food is consumed as well. I mean, I, I, I'm sure it's just a matter of time those companies come into India as well because the kind of challenges we have. I mean, feeding 1.2, 1.3 uh, million people, high quality, protein rich, it's going to be a huge opportunity. But the early days, what we are seeing is how do you use the existing infrastructure? and to give more variety and uh, more convenience and less uh, price, more affordability. So these are the things that uh, at least companies like you know, Rock Cafe, we are trying to solve. Uh, so for us, the value proposition is really, we are the online coffee shop, online cafe, whatever you want to uh, call, to give customers the, I mean, coffee, why coffee, it's the second most consumed beverage uh, in the world after water. And it's the second most traded commodity after crude oil. So coffee is huge. <laughs> Uh, but nobody has done coffee in a way that you can actually build a big business as like FA Coffee or Starbucks which have done offline but there's a huge play uh, online as well and that's what uh, essentially what we thought you know uh, there is a huge opportunity there is a real pain uh, uh, as well that we can solve so we went after it and it's you know so far it's going okay so uh, with that let me just uh, do you want to uh, have any questions on this before uh, I, I don't want to dissect this quadrants too much I'm just uh, trying to set a context uh, you know you have Different ways. The idea is there are different players who are trying to do different things. Uh, you know, some of them are core value proposition around logistics. Some of them are uh, extremely focused on partnering with the uh, existing offline players. Some are logistics heavy. Some are technology heavy. Some are capital. They are literally my favorite in the US uh, landscape because they are using data, uh, data layer strongly. Uh, they are doing prescriptive analytics and all that to almost preempt what kind of food uh, that the customers are going to expect that I should put on my menu tomorrow. So it's, uh, it's really uh, using uh, tech and data, a lot, a lot of uh, variables to kind of preempt what your customers want that you can fulfill in the most uh, uh, efficient way. Uh, do you have a question? Yeah, so uh, <laughs> India, since you took up US as a partner, yeah. uh, India and US, if you see, uh, US started with building the food tech with preservation. They started with preservation, got to a level of maturity, and then they started doing uh, uh, basically ready to eat food and frozen food and all that. Yes, sir. In India, we have a problem of preservation today. What we are solving today is a logistic problem. Somewhere good, good food is that somewhere there's a hungry guy, they want that food, you are trying to solve that. Better quality, as you said, all those things were solved. But the basic problems of preservation, the food wastage, and all these are not solved. So, what would the landscape be in India? What do you think will happen in the next year or so? We don't see too much innovation coming in that space yet. I mean, honestly, there are, uh, I mean, you have traditional players uh, um, in certain traditional segments of the products that have been around. But, uh, you know, there are, uh, ready to eat is obviously a huge segment, uh, especially a lot of this. Uh, if but that's a trading segment given the talent is coming in and all that also. Yeah, so I think uh, if you look at uh, the kind of cost that you have to incur to make. Uh, around uh, the preservation itself, the packaging and all that. And uh, compared to uh, the fresh alternatives, it's fresh is always cheaper as well. 
unless you are catering to a segment that is otherwise not, uh, you know, uh, uh, they don't have the fresh uh, uh, stuff available, which is mostly the export markets. So that's why, you know, MPRs or PRs, all, all these companies, they build a huge business. They, they run offline uh, stores and restaurants in India, where the entire packaging business is catered to uh, outside India, right? And that's for a reason. Now, if you bring uh, certain new products into the mix, uh, which are high value items, but that would actually uh, have a better trade off with the packaging, with the preservation, the landscape may actually start uh, uh, you know, emerging uh, more favorable to the Indian situation as well. But we, I mean, at least personally, I don't see much happening in the front yet, but it's just a matter of time. I mean, if you think of uh, uh, the consumption of uh, uh, any, any uh, protein rich item, right? India, we're just getting started. I mean, we are not a country of, uh, you know, Protein is something that's like top, uh, not even in the top five, top six. But if you uh, if you look at items like soya and uh, even vegetarian protein items, quinoa uh, and all, they're just coming. You know, we're just in the very early stages of that uh, uh, consumption change. That's because of a couple of reasons. Obviously, the customer sophistication is kicking in. A lot of people are obviously trying to be, you know, embracing those alternatives uh, for health or you know for aspiration, whatever. You know, all good reasons. And also, you're getting uh, uh, this uh, products available in the Indian market. So it's a, just a matter of time before you see that uh, balance shifting as well. One, uh, one question came in, and you, you see these layers evolve in India now. Uh, if you follow the e commerce side, it's carried on to the physical goods store, and the online setting of the same book. Now, the marketplace where the seller is not, the chip card is not the only way. So in this model, you have the restaurants serving great food in there for my family, the online food part now ordering, yep. so you can deliver. And is there a marketplace which will quickly evolve and then bypass all of this? So is there a is there a way? So two questions. So is there a model that you see? Second, what is the barrier to entry for somebody now when we have a good delivery infrastructure which was not there five years ago? Mm -hmm. Now we have good technology presence. Somebody to become a top candidate. Yeah. There is a ready-made shopping cart available on Shopify. There is a great delivery infrastructure with multiple providers are yeah. distributing stuff. Do you, do you see that? What, what is the IP here? What is yeah. the area to entry? Yeah, so let's, uh, let me answer these uh, two questions separately. The first one is uh, the business model itself, right? Do you see certain marketplace like models emerging? There are a few that already exist. Uh, so we are very early stages of this whole sector, right? I mean, I think. Uh, uh, for example, somebody like Tapsi, uh, uh, which is not uh, Lazo, uh, they are trying to be a marketplace. In the sense, they are saying, we don't want to make this uh, product, all we are going to be, we are a, a data layer and we are a technology layer. What we are going to do is partner with offline people to enable them to use this competency of data and technology for them to make their products better. So in a way, that's a, that's a marketplace model where you are essentially onboarding. Similarly, uh, Spoonjoy, Spoonjoy is, uh, uh, not cooking, uh, they actually uh, leverage uh, the commercial kitchen space capacity. Mm -hmm. So in a way, they are essentially saying, look, I don't want to invest in something that already exists. I want to invest uh, where uh, I can build my muscle. So um, they're not they're not exactly the marketplace maturity of the e-commerce model yet, but it's just a matter of time. They are, I mean, people are testing out different models. Uh, some of them actually uh, actually are saying, look, it's not working out. Let me actually start investing in my own kitchens as well. So uh, you know, it's uh, by the time the dust settles, it's going to be one, one or a couple of years. Who knows, right? Even in the US, you don't see a pure uh, marketplace model in the FMB yet. There are a bunch of. Uh, I mean, the marketplace is happening on the services. Yes. So if you if you look at chefs, there are a bunch of marketplaces that are organizing chefs. Uh, you know that, that that is very mature in the US, and that is getting uh, a lot more mature in the Indian context as well, like Ola Chef and uh, you know a bunch of them. Then there are certain players who are aggregating specialty items. You know, you have marketplace for uh, you know uh, bakery items. So when it's a specialty item, it's easy to essentially say, look, I'm going to get the best uh, 50 ba bakers in the town, and let me just uh, give you the the tech marketing and the fulfillment uh, uh, muscle, and you're off. So essentially, those things are happening. Um, so I think uh, uh, we will cover some of these. I think this is actually a pretty good. Uh, the earlier slide I showed was more in the US context. This is the next slide of the Indian context. Uh, there is this firm called Fraction. Uh, I'm sure you guys have followed it. So they, they do uh, pretty detailed uh, uh, analysis on a lot of sectors and food happens to be one of the sectors they follow the invest as well. So uh, I'll cover this. Uh, the second question, which is I think more uh, uh, relevant, is uh, where are the barriers? Where is, where is the value 
getting created, which basically, uh, where is the muzzle that's uh, getting built, right? If you look at, uh, you know, uh, I, I call this sector as habit forming sector. Essentially, anything, once the consumers get a taste of this, uh, and you like it, you say, look, I'm going to start using this more. Because I always spend on food, and if there is a better way to, uh, a better way for me to spend my money on getting the same thing, I'll switch my behavior. So it's it's less, uh, you know, in terms of uh, fundamental shift in the consumer pattern or a behavior pattern. All I'm saying is, look, instead of going to cafe coffee day, you can still go there. I mean, just cut half fifty percent all the time. You know, fifty percent of the time you get dropped okay. as long as it's it's good, uh, it's uh, you know the same price or lesser. Or uh, finally, the you know the the entire customer experience, everything that comes around is good. You know all those things, right? So the happy forming companies are uh, they're mushrooming a lot. So if you look at uh, the the prior uh, uh, you know 2014 and 2013 were years of the whole transformation, the likes of Ola, the taxi machine, all these companies, right? So we always uh, wonder as well that uh, how come there are only few companies that got in this sector, whereas food. You already have 250 uh, odd companies in the last uh, couple of quarters, and it's not on the stop there, it's going to be a few thousand companies. Because the capital to get started is very, very less. First of all, the cap, you know, you're talking about anything to do with transportation, e commerce. Uh, I'm talking about more traditional e commerce sectors, but food, the capital is, uh, and I encourage you guys actually, these are, uh, I want to, I hope that you take away some ideas uh, uh, you know, to uh, do something on your own as well. There are some flip sides. Capital is not a constraint. And uh, to your point, a lot of the value uh, generators, you could actually use them on a SaaS model. SaaS both at, uh, in a uh, technology standpoint, also uh, in, the, in the standpoint of fulfillment. For example, we do our own fulfillment and we have third party partners that we tied up with to do the fulfillment. And it's going to be uh, that way because somebody is uh, investing more, uh, you know, uh, mind share and capital to get the fulfillment part, which we are not. So we would rather outsource that part, right? You got to essentially where the fee, I, mean, I can talk about Dr. Fair and I'll, I'll, uh, I'm pretty sure that's the same thing with every company that's building essentially uh, what they hope a hundred million dollar, a billion dollar company model with a deal. You got to essentially create something uh, that is a category leader. You got to create a brand. So food is as consumer uh, facing as it gets. So you can't essentially build a business just by providing a service, but you got to create a brand. So the companies that are going to be successful are brand builds. Brand essentially that gets built over consistent customer uh, experience that almost translates into loyalty. So that's where the value is going to get generated. All the different items that basically uh, make that happen, they will be enablers. Uh, so one is uh, being a calculator, two is uh, to be uh, a brand player. You can, you definitely have to be a calculator. You, uh, for example. If you, uh, the next slide I'll show you. So, you could cut this into like eight or ten different uh, sections. So, there are already three, four companies. Uh, these guys have done this report like six months back. So, you can imagine uh, there are 200 more names that basically you can put on this slide uh, now compared to six months ago. It looks like. Uh, <coughs> you know, uh, a big uh, confusing cluster, right? But if you carefully examine, this is, by the way, this is not the only way to cut this. There are different ways to, you can cut it, right? But the idea is you got to essentially emerge as the category leader. Uh, you know, uh, it's not as broad as uh, a taxi sector. Uh, you know, where you say, look, I'm on demand, uh, affordable taxi, and uh, back then, <coughs> taxi for sure, you don't have enough space uh, to be even the second, you got to basically get acquired by all. Food is not like that because there are, this has a lot more uh, you know, uh, dimensions to it, a lot more nuances to it. So you could actually build a smaller, uh, you can address a smaller segment, but you could still bring, uh, build a bigger business, uh, provided you become a calculator in that segment and you build a brand around it. So that's, uh, Nikesh, uh, uh, does it answer your question? Yes. I have a question. Yeah. Actually. So you said that uh, it's a happy for me industry. But I see as food, people flirt a lot with food, right? Yeah. I mean, you know, you don't go to the same restaurant every time. Yeah. Uh, similarly, while you are ordering. So for me, um, that is one of the, I mean, we are working on some ideas over and when we did the market research, that's one of the major problems, how to actually, you know, form this habit, or build a habit forming product, uh, food product, because 
This is the place where people go to IIT. The second one is uh, capital uh, requirement. So I felt it otherwise that it's a capital money. Uh, um, so you have that asset money section, right? right. So they own the kitchen. Yeah. So suppose you have a, maybe drop cafe is something, okay? I mean, uh, but if you are. Uh, oh, we have our own kitchen as well. Even okay. if you have your own kitchen. Yeah. See, we are comparing this to a traditional if restaurant. The category is, say, something very special category. Then you would have to have your own uh, uh, kitchen, uh, the ingredients you use, and the chefs you hire. Right. So all have to be you know, a little bit over like the normal uh, uh, restaurants or the yeah. normal caterings. Which so let me let me answer this. Uh, fresh menu, right? Fresh menu is uh, by far uh, uh, you know one of the largest places in the sector. Even though they're like one to fifteen months old. Uh, they're I said 12 or 15 months old, it's older, that tells you uh, how uh, uh, end this sector is, right? They're doing uh, uh, around 12 to 300 dollars per day uh, in six, seven locations uh, across Bangalore. Now, fresh menu uh, spends uh, close to 50, 40 odd lakhs. Now, don't quote me on these numbers. These are, these are essentially, we kind of reverse engineer what goes to make a fresh menu, right? So, I'm talking from that experience. Uh, so, they have six uh, kitchens. Uh, by spending close to 1 crore rupees. And the scaling is also another problem because of the delivery time. And yeah, yeah. So, I mean, we've we got some of those uh, challenges. Uh, uh, but uh, when it comes to investment, they're able to uh, create essentially a brand that could cater to pretty much uh, all the uh, major uh, uh, geographical areas of Bangalore by spending 1 crore uh, into their, uh, you know, logistics, into their uh, back-end logistics, not uh, uh, front-end logistics. Now, imagine you creating a restaurant in any of these areas where fresh menu is, you need three to four crores to set up. So essentially it's a relative comparison compared to the traditional place. Within this grid, fresh menu is definitely the most capital intensive. Now if I compare fresh menu to ours, we'll spend one fourth of it because we're not investing in a commercial level kitchen that's gonna, you know, we basically will invest a, a very light uh, uh, commercial kitchen with a couple of uh, coffee related uh, equipment and all that. So we're, we're gonna be doing the same so we can do it four times faster with the same capital than a fresh menu does. So it's all relative. Now I think the, the more important question is uh, on the first one about uh, uh, how do you... To start them actually, I tell you. So when you start, it's a capital intensive. Yeah. Even we worked out, we got every one month going to fund this kind of a uh, uh, you know, figure. Okay. So which is to start up people, which is not a mess, less of a money uh, where you can immediately start something like another e-commerce. Yeah, we started off with 5 lakhs, so uh, I think uh, it, it all depends on, so don't invest, yeah. I mean, we rented everything. Okay, we rented really everything, so I mean, there are different models. Uh, before you actually have the, once you establish the product market fit, then you start making, we could easily run the business for the first 6 to 12 months on uh, leasing, everything, pretty much everything can be rented out. Uh, you know, technology, machinery, people, everybody is uh, on a rented basis. You don't invest uh, anything beyond a couple of weeks, uh, in a couple of weeks notice. The moment you say, look, it's not going, uh, you know, where, it, where I expect it to so you can just, uh, you know, uh, there are no shutdown costs either because you're renting uh, the stuff. We are now, just a couple of weeks back, we start making our investments uh, on our own just because we are in phase two, which is we established a broad market fit. We see uh, essentially the traction uh, realizing the way we want it. But uh, the uh, earlier question you asked is uh, more uh, pertinent, it's more, I think, critical, which is uh, how do you establish uh, the habit forming, uh, the recurrence of the customer? Yeah, so I think uh, th th these are, I try to essentially answer them separately to start with and then they'll converge because they kind of are related uh, to uh, the same uh, uh, side of the coin. So as part of creating a brand and uh, a category leadership, you got to essentially establish the brand loyalty, the customer loyalty. Some of the, the names that you get quoted out of the 250 to 60 uh, companies, uh, six or seven are making the rounds the most, uh, essentially companies with uh, more than a year. Uh, those companies, they all have almost 50 to 70 percent uh, returning customers. So, and uh, if you see, that is the most critical element in deciding whether you can't, this is not a segment where you say, look, uh, I don't really care uh, how many transactions you do. This is a business where long term value of the customer is going to be extremely important. Because the first time you acquire the customer, you spend 
almost three to four times of their uh, you know next uh, four visits you are buying of friends. So you better expect uh, that loyalty factor, that uh, referral uh, uh, you know factor, that so virality factor, all to kick in. Otherwise, you, uh, you know essentially that's the reason why uh, restaurant business, not just in India, all over the world, even traditionally, is one of the most difficult ones. I mean, only. Uh, the statistic is uh, two or three out of every uh, ten restaurants uh, end up uh, surviving the first year. Uh, that's because they, they don't establish a connection with the customers. So in our case as well, even though we have uh, we've been uh, operational two months now, uh, uh, we have seventy percent of the customers, seventy five percent actually that are uh, recurring. And also the same our revenues, even though we're acquiring hundred new customers a day, seventy five percent of revenues are coming from from our uh, recurring customers. So these are extremely important. If you are not doing, if that's not happening, there is something wrong. Because if you, if, you, if your customers are leaving you, if there is a high amount of attrition, fundamentally the value proposition is not there, or your product is not there. So one of those things is basically is a, a clear giveaway. So uh, how do you bring that uh, recurrence is basically, you know, in terms of our, uh, our uh, the entire founding uh, member team, 50% of our time goes in engaging customers, in taking their feedback. In ensuring what makes it uh, stickier for them, so you know that's that's extremely important aspect, and uh, you you got to solve for it. You're not going to just stumble upon it. It's uh, it's completely a uh, uh, you know, exercise that uh, you keep on uh, going about it. To your question, the uh, again this goes back to uh, the idea that uh, it's not food. Uh, any startup, right? You got to know your customer exactly well. You know you're not going to start a business saying, hey, look, I got I, for example in our case, let's put it in the context of Rocket Pay. We are talking about uh, selling coffee, taking internet-based orders. Um, you know, essentially, it's, if I have to put uh, in one line, that's what it is. We, we do some other things, like when we're online cafe, we do some quick bites on the top and all that, but it's an co online coffee shop. We narrow down our customer segment between 24 to 34, uh, people who have smartphones in Bangalore, and we just talk to them. So we're not talking to anybody below 24, we're not talking to anybody above 35. That's because 90% of our customer segment we really is going to come from that side. We're going to extend our product, we're going to extend our value proposition later on. But in today, today's uh, uh, rock to face uh, scenario, we clearly define what is our customer persona. We call it the customer persona. And what is that that they are looking for? And what is that that they're giving? Is there a clear uh, you know, fit in terms of the product and the, uh, that customer uh, aspirations? So to your point, uh, we, so that number, by the way, translates to around uh, 1.2 million in Bangalore. It's a huge number. So we're targeting 1.2 million people who are between 24 to 35, who have smartphones. Who and the reason why smartphones? And there are certain behavior traits that we go after, right? You know, they should like uh, you know e-commerce uh, uh, savvy, and uh, you know they obviously have some kind of uh, online uh, behavior, uh, you know, exhibitor and all that. That a million plus people in Bangalore, it's a huge customer segment, but they're all certain commonalities that I'm going to go after. So I'm going to only talk to them, even that segment is very diverse, but at least there are three, four elements that are common. So I can basically keep them together. I can bring, build them, expand my value proposition around those three, four elements that bring them together. To your point, if uh, uh, am I going to talk to everyone across uh, different uh, customer clusters? No. So North India, South India, within Bangalore, in Bangalore, we have all kinds of uh, uh, customer segments. So, for the uh, last question, okay. Any more questions? So, I think uh, this uh, is the uh, landscape. You see, there is subscription-based uh, uh, services. There are subscription-based services as well. Uh, for example, there is a company called Nutso Salad that uh, um, you know you could actually subscribe for salads. Uh, they send you every day. Uh, we actually did coffee subscriptions as well. We decided uh, to stop. Just because we want to focus on on demand before we build a big business, uh, then we can introduce a new product. Then you have office focus uh, versus residential, then you have on demand, uh, and then you know, obviously late night delivery, you know, different uh, cuts of this uh, segment. Where does uh, Rock Cafe come in? Uh, so we come in where I put that circle. So we have office focus with our own kitchen, own delivery, and on demand. So, so this is started because you said the amount in which it was 5 lakhs. Yeah. So how did you cater the, what I think one of the challenges will be to your delivery? Yeah. Because in present scenario, the delivery time cost is pretty high. Mm -hmm. So how did you try to cover that for instance? 
Yeah, so I mean, the file as I was referring to was uh, the capex, deliveries, uh, opex. Uh, you keep on investing mm -hmm. whenever the delivery rate goes up. Uh, but uh, we, that's why uh, one of the things we have around uh, a, a dozen of delivery uh, folks on our own in our formula facility, but we need at least 25. At the, at the current situation we're in, uh, for the amount of orders we're doing. So the rest 50% is the last 50% we outsource to another uh, partner who just does uh, fulfill input the uh, FNB space. They have a couple of months old, same as us, but they have 150 delivery points because that's their business. So they're a B2B facing business who essentially help companies uh, like Rocket Ray to do the fulfillment. And uh, they're going to do it better than us, uh, cheaper than us. They're, they're going, the technology uh, is going to be uh, more robust than us just because we're solving for other things uh, uh, that they're not solving for and vice versa. So delivery, uh, I think that's a segment which nobody has solved for. Uh, in fact, I, I've been uh, meeting uh, a bunch of other uh, entrepreneurs in the space uh, who are really doing some good stuff around uh, uh, how do you, uh, people are talking about all kinds of things, uh, including internet of things, uh, you know, fancy, uh, some people are really solving it on the, on the ground, how can I include engineers uh, who can work part time so I could uh, introduce more uh, workforce into this, you know, very simple, uh, but you know, uh, people are getting paid like 20,000 rupees a month, so it's not, uh, it's not any more, uh, uh, you know, you can't write or write off, right? I mean, there's a huge demand for this, uh, just like uh, the way drivers are still in hot pursuit, so. Uh, we want to have a different life for the deliveries. You are covering deliveries or something, or? Uh, no, I don't have a slide, but uh, I can take your questions. Con in your context, like the coffee, yeah. cold coffee, for example. So, how do you solve this? I mean, you have one kitchen, or now you have multiple kitchens? So, currently we have one kitchen. By end of June, we'll have three more kitchens. So, you are not for so with the, we uh, we do it within five kilometer radius. Have you done any innovations in the delivery? So the uh, the innovation that we've done is to essentially keep uh, uh, the coffee from the point it gets brewed until it gets consumed. How do you how quickly you can get it uh, delivered to the customer? We're not in, we haven't yet invested in the machinery to basically make it happen. And it's not just us uh, globally. That's been basically uh, a challenge. And increasingly, we are also uh, seeing a lot of shift towards uh, colder products. So, in fact, uh, uh, we have most use in our cold coffees and cold beverages. Uh, two third of our uh, customer demand is coming from cold. So, we did not, we were going to solve for that uh, sooner, but uh, based on how the, the whole demand is playing out, we are solving for the, the uh, room temperature and colder products first, which I think is lesser, uh, less uh, demanding compared to uh, hot products. Uh, and also your cold uh, stuff, cold coffees or beverages and smoothies and shakes, uh, you know, all that stuff, they have a longer shelf life compared to a hot coffee. Hot coffee is only one and a half hour, whereas the colder uh, products can basically uh, you know, stay there for three, four hours. So we are focusing on essentially wrapping up our, uh, that uh, segment because we see a huge secular demand for that. Uh, if uh, you have it otherwise, where people are saying, look, I just love your, I mean, people say they love our filter coffee and uh, lattes and all that stuff. Uh, but right now we just use our uh, you know, Jagar solution of uh, Floss, you know, it's, uh, we don't have to uh, reinvent that. But the very fact that I'm in one hour, uh, you know, a freshly brewed coffee, uh, you know, without you leaving your office, that's, that's the value provision people are really attracted to. So these are some of the companies, I could share these slides, uh, anybody who wants it, uh, just uh, let me know. So, I mean, the reason I put this slide is, uh, these are all the delivery facing companies, right, essentially. You know, the, the slide before are companies like ourselves, whereas uh, these companies are essentially on the logistics. So, and there is some data in terms of how much, uh, how many orders they're doing and uh, how much money they're raising. So, in the interest of time, let's just talk about uh, some of the challenges. Um, so, I think, uh, it's uh, safe to assume that we all believe in the opportunity and uh, how this is unfolding. But uh, what are the challenges? Uh, where entrepreneurs uh, are struggling and where investors are obviously being very, you know, uh, uh, very off and also conservative before they are cutting their checks. So broadly, these are uh, three more of these items. Um, when you're expanding, uh, how do you keep it consistent? Because if you, if you don't give the consistent experience, all bets are off. You know, you're not going to become a category leader, you're not going to build a brand. Uh, so, how do we serve Rock Cafe Coffee in Whitefield the same way as I was serving in Port Because my customer in Whitefield obviously is going to take
taste it in Portugal as well at some point, if not today. And how do we do the same thing in Gurgaon in 50 more cities where we went around a couple of years? So consistency is going to be an extremely, extremely uh, you know, critical challenge. It's not for, uh, you know, this is something that's across the board. Even, even for the people who are actually uh, talking about uh, long food, even the logistics fulfillment companies, they also have to be consistent. Uh, if you're not, if you say the value proposition is uh, 30 minutes, uh, a classic uh, case uh, is the Swiggy actually. It just happened uh, in the last few days. I don't know how many of you uh, bought in uh, food delivered by Swiggy. They got their uh, seed round and day round almost done with the value proposition that you're going to do it in 30 minutes. And uh, so, great thing. You know, they were able to do it until they were like $1,000 a day. Now they moved it back to 60 minutes. So people just like, you know, are going to dump them, right? Because this, this is not what you promised. Now don't go back and say, 60 minutes, I mean, I, I'm back to my boring world of walking to a restaurant, I can pick it up my own, you know, all that stuff. So even consistency is uh, extremely important for every uh, player in the segment. The loss of logistics, right, timelines, safety, uh, you know, it's, uh, this is something that people are uh, solving as we speak uh, in different ways, uh, trying to get different uh, kinds of workforce into the uh, segment, uh, bring more technology, bring more innovation, bring more uh, collaboration, you know, all that kind of stuff. Then uh, the third point is how do you establish the credibility and uh, how do you establish the, you know, the leadership in the particular uh, sub-segment you are, you are, you are serving? Because uh, if you look at the, the couple of slides before, it seems like everyone is doing the same thing. I mean, you can't really differentiate, you know, it's Spoon Joy, it's Fresh Menu, they're all, if they realize one of the products of Freshman U is doing well, they put the product uh, from uh, tomorrow on. So it's, uh, there is no clear demarcation, there is no clear differentiation. Like in our case, at least we can say we are the only game in town when it comes to beverages. We are the only guys in the entire country which comes to coffee. So at least we feel slightly better about that, at least as of now. And no guarantee that uh, the segment basically has potential, which it seems like it has. Other people are not going to come in, right? It's just a matter of time. And some investors already told uh, to us uh, that, uh, hey, look, uh, just a matter of time before I'm going to tell my portfolio companies to start coffee. Like, good luck with that. So, uh, the last thing is economics, right? Uh, there is a there is a huge uh, debate around this, which is, should you approach this as a traditional e-commerce way? Don't care about the bottom line; just go and get the top line. Uh, don't care about the customer acquisition costs. Uh, you know, we're gonna we're gonna take care of that later. Uh, three, four years later, the world is going to be a different place when a few hundred million uh, Indians are going to just shop uh, uh, day in and day out without getting tired. Food is not that way. Food, you've got to have a, uh, you know, a fundamentally economic uh, uh, positive model right from day one. At least on the contribution margin side. So if you start a business in the food tech, which does not have positive contribution margins, there is something wrong fundamentally with what you're doing. Because the, the Logistics, the, the last mile issues and the customer acquisition can get laid out later. But you've got to make your contribution margin positive. A lot of people are not realizing the fact they are you know, just uh, uh, selling products basically at a, at a cost, uh, uh, less pricing and all that stuff. That fundamentally is, uh, you know, as the, as the sector gets mature, that's going to change. Uh, so Goldman Sachs did a report just uh, last week. Uh, they said uh, between Flipkart and Snapdeal, they need $20 billion just to, uh, in the next three, four years, by the way, to maintain their growth that they had and to maintain their market share. This is to acquire the Indian customers. So this is not, you know, it's not apples to apples. It's not, you know, different uh, sectors have different, uh, they have enough market share that, you know, since the investors, uh, bad money is going to have to have to, good money, good money is going to have to, bad money and all that kind of stuff, right? But uh, the last point, uh, anybody who has ideas, uh, you know, in this space, extremely be cautious about uh, building a, a cash flow, uh, at least contribution plus uh, model right from day one. So, any questions on this? So, I, I'm going to spend like two minutes uh, uh, to talk about talk today just because I want to kind of draw this into the context of what we are doing. Uh, call it uh, the plug time as well, but uh, you know, I think I covered this. We started with this thing called Office Coffee Sucks, essentially, that's our value proposition. And we said, look, if you have trouble with your office coffee, talk to us, and we have essentially something that's better than your office coffee. Um, so, this was the landing page we just did. Uh, we spent uh, the first uh, 
couple of months, sorry, first couple of weeks, we did, we did nothing except to uh, run this uh, landing page in Facebook, uh, spending uh, less than a lakh, one lakh rupees. Uh, that was the best copy that we did over the holiday this year. We got 500 people who signed up, giving their address, giving their preferences, you know, more information than we ever needed. You know, saying, look, I, I want this because I really need it. Uh, from there, that's that's when I'm, I'm putting this in the context of uh, how do you approach a startup. It's not just F and B. Once you know that there is uh, a value proposition that you want to go after or solve, the first thing you want to do is validate the thesis. How do you establish the product market fit? Very low cost experiments. You could use uh, uh, you know a few thousand rupees, not few thousand anymore, but uh, less than a thousand dollars. You know, since you're six thousand rupees. Spend it on Facebook, spend it on Google AdWords. More on Facebook, Google AdWords is not uh, startup friendly. Um, and then test it out and see if I'm talking to, say, 100 people are coming to this uh, web, web, sub website, the landing page, 10 to 15 of them are actually uh, reacting to it and giving you the information. And if I could do it uh, a million times, what's going to look like? What is the customer uh, acquisition cost? How much money I can make from that one customer? In the long run, if I do it well, I'm going to make money. That's really what you're going to prove with this uh, initial uh, thesis validation. Once we have uh, this proven, right? As I said, two thousand people said, "Look, I want uh, the service." Then we got to figure out, okay, how do you build the MVP now, the minimum viable uh, product? How do I build the product? Because the first product is always going to be inefficient. It's going to be clunky. It's going to be not the best one that uh, you. Uh, what the whole team is. The idea is really to come up with a, a product that at least meets the minimum value proposition that you put on the table with which you attracted the initial set of customers. So in our case, uh, we spent like a couple of weeks, uh, we traveled to corporate states, we consulted some ministers, we essentially looked at it. We did a lot of primary and secondary research, what are the coffees that are in demand, you know, if we have to start, what should be the, uh, the SQ strategy should look like, all that stuff, and then uh, start solving for the logistics. We, you could keep the coffee hot for three, four hours in this class, but after one hour, you just lose that punch. So we just made certain SOPs that doesn't matter. Even the customer is going to punch out every guy in the face for not delivering it. Don't deliver if it's more than one hour, because in the long run, you know you're going to lose the brand if you give a bad cup of coffee. So, so those are some of those things uh, we did in terms of uh, building the MVP. And there are, I mean, you got to have, you got to have at least three, four things that you want to say why, why this is good and why, uh, you know, uh, I, um, the customer should be excited about this. A lot of the stuff we already covered, consistency, freshness, and whatnot. So, and there are some numbers, um, but that's that's about it. So I think uh, I can take uh, a few more questions if you guys have, or else, uh, you know, happy to share my details along with this presentation. Please. Question for the pricing. How are we going to analyze and put a pricing for? So I'll give an example. So for example, if you see a sandwich, we normally have around say 30, 40 rupees, max 50 rupees. Now freshmen have started giving the sandwich for 200 rupees. I think 100 rupees, right? The sandwich is 100 rupees. Okay. So how normally when it's your recommendation, when you put out the pricing? Yeah. What are the parameters that you should consider? Yeah, so pricing is, uh, again, uh, you're not going to get it right in the first instance. It's again a uh, discovery process. Uh, you want to have certain parameters that decide the framework for your pricing, uh, but that's going to be a range. You're not going to hit upon the exact pricing. Uh, for example, we start off uh, our coffees at 40 rupees, our hot coffees at 40, and our cold coffees at 50. Now, after uh, hitting uh, uh, you know, a mark that we think basically says, look, I think there is a broader embrace of this in the market, mm -hmm. and there is a strong uh, repeatability of the customers. Essentially, we felt there is a certain amount of price in the elasticity that already got built into it. We uh, raised the price by 10 rupees, people did not even bother, they did not even notice. And at some point, you're going to increase uh, the price further by putting a delivery charge. You know, these are the things that we got to essentially, what, what we are saying is, uh, what we are seeing is the customers essentially are not uh, uh, coming to this uh, for only the price savings. You know, there's there's a lot more that's riding on the convenience. 
And when you compare yourselves to the peers in the market who is doing exactly something similar, that gives you a great data points in terms of what should be the broad range that I should myself in. Uh, and then you start essentially playing with that range to that extent where you say, look, this is the narrow range that I want to play with now. I, and at some point we will hit up, uh, we will we'll discover our pricing with our customers because your customers and my customers will be different. In every business, customers uh, react and uh, you know act differently. So, so for example, what the example you have given, I think the delivery charges differently fine, uh, and but the changing or increasing the core product time, uh, how easy that is? Because it's very difficult. I mean, you you. Uh, it's, it's very, very difficult. You would have uh, the chance to do it uh, at the most a couple of times. Uh, you know, uh, you could do it in the first occasion. Uh, like, we actually almost uh, are done with that. We don't have any further role. What we can do is to change now product mix and start increasing higher price tolerance so I can increase my overall price, uh, blended price uh, to a better situation. But we build the problem for 40, and now we do it for 50. I don't think our customers are going to uh, relish the fact that we're going to uh, increase it to 60. They're going to say, what the heck you guys are doing? So we already lost that. And when we put that price at 50, we took almost a few weeks uh, to uh, do a lot of customer uh, you know, surveys and uh, uh, some amount of uh, uh, discovery shopping ourselves and whatnot. And we, we realized that 50 is actually something that we could stick to, not just for the next few months, but even for the next uh, few years, as long as you pass on the inflation. Um, you know, the inflation, if you're, if you're breaking the pocket 50 by next year, we will say, look, I mean, this is inflation, it's not 100 million they're trying to rip off. But that's, that's basically what I think, uh, uh, you know, makes sense. It's not so hard to change into reduce pricing as a signal, right? Sometimes the, the 40 is a signal that this is this type of problem. You know, when you say 150 is a sandwich, a subway sandwich is 180, which if you, if you look at fresh menu, bread sandwiches are, they please, Pictures of it look aristocratic, right? So five star sandwich, that's positioning. Now, whether you believe it or not, <laughs> they were showing you that's their position. <coughs> and so it also depends on what, what signal you want to move, but like you said, what segment you focus on. Uh, I tell you, I want refreshment all the time. And I think oh, I do. Yeah, that's what you yeah. I think it's a need. Uh, I think it's lower than what it should be. Mm -hmm. Right? So now and I'm probably an anomaly here, but some of, some of my colleagues who also agree will say, yeah, I know what it's offering. It's just the, the way the package position, the way they deliver, the timing, the, the whole nine yards. So my alternative is a subway, which is 180. So it's still cheaper than that. And the convenience, uh, like you said, all the parameters of delivery, convenience, style, specialty, novelty, Moroccan sandwich, high sandwich, all this. I think uh, they're, they're, uh, for the current product and pricing, it's uh, it's a fair deal. But uh, uh, you know, if I were an investor, my doubts uh, are around the depth of that market. So out of uh, 25 we are, you are the only one who's going to embrace it uh, left and right. I fresh menu uh, just because I have to compare myself to them once every 15 days. If I don't happen to be in this business, I will probably order once every couple of months. So that's been the feedback that we've received. So what is the depth in the market? Now, that's why they introduced the 100 rupee sandwiches. So earlier they were like, look, we're not gonna talk to, they're like apples, right, which is, unless you have 300 rupees to shop, I'm not gonna even talk to you. Okay. Now they're saying like 100 rupee sandwiches, they definitely get 50 rupee drinks as well. And then that's where the uh, the, the fabric of the company is gonna unfold. Now what are you, as a freshman you, are you gonna do 50 rupee sandwiches? Are you gonna maintain the same experience? Is are you going to be happy about the 50 rupee service and 300 rupee service? Which segment are you playing in? What is your product focus? So they're already facing that uh, music. So I think that's where you got to keep consistent. One more thing here, uh, the, this risk as base that you have. So you are starting this type of business. Mm -hmm. So how do you get split up? Okay, the coffee ever says you have very less uh, risk on base but uh, we can. No, you can't. I mean, it's uh, once once beans and all you can store. Right? Once no no beans and all uh, once brewed coffee is gone, right? Uh, yeah. Essentially, so what type of waste is how you try to control? Yeah, that is again a risk for you for your uh, business, right? Uh, yeah, so in fact, uh, coffee is uh, the most challenging because uh, it's uh, it has the lowest amount of shelf life. Uh, the ingredients are super expensive. Uh, 
Uh, so we, we pay almost 500 rupees a kilo, where Starbucks and uh, uh, you know cafe coffee is just 200 rupees a kilo uh, uh, beans in their coffees. So it's uh, because I mean they obviously are using uh, they're focusing on the experience. But then coffee quality is not the important thing. The social experience and the server, how they're behaving with you, the the hygiene of the place. For us, it's just the product, goddamn product. I mean whether coffee did you get a hit or not? If you don't get a hit from our coffee, that means we lost the plot. So we got to invest two and a half, three times than the, uh, the, the competition on the quality of the ingredients. We use bisleri as uh, the only water because it has some bearing on uh, how the coffee is good. So coming back to your question, it's just a matter of uh, making the business mature, right? You know, how, what are the kind of process you're going to set up? Uh, to, uh, uh, to ensure that uh, you know, every aspect of that uh, value chain, you are essentially it's, uh, just in time, uh, you know, uh, supply chain management. We have uh, we, we we haven't invested yet in our own roasting and grinding back uh, capabilities for the coffee, but in a matter of a couple of months we will because that's the only way we can basically reduce the cost and increase the quality and reduce the wastage. But in the meantime, what we are doing is we are working with our supplier almost on an hourly basis. So. The moment uh, our, our staff, they give a notice to uh, the supplier two hours in advance, everything is just in time. So essentially, we're not uh, acquiring the coffee for tomorrow, we're not using the coffee that we uh, roasted and grinded yesterday. So we got in the model to that extent. Uh, but is it scalable? It's not scalable. That means I got to start investing in my own uh, you know, facilities for me to manage. So it, it just, as you mature, as you increase the scale, you got to invest in different capabilities. But wastage is obviously a big uh, you know, issue in this space. Uh, you, you could. Uh, in the, in the West, especially in the US, people obviously try to make a uh, uh, bang for the buck out of everything, right? So essentially, they don't they, they donate the meals. Uh, they essentially. Uh, so, uh, but but yeah, I mean, you know, they, you can't avoid uh, the entire, entire wastage, but how do you essentially get more stakeholder points, <laughs> you know, for, for ensuring that you get. Uh, so, all, those are all. We, we also donate uh, our food already, you know, uh, we, we donate our sandwiches. Uh, Every every day we uh, donate a few dozen sandwiches to. Uh, so it's really part of better utilization of the um, that thing. But when you talk about it in terms of uh, investors, yeah, and you're coming up, then how you want to uh, show the how you try to show the mitigation of that uh, wastage? Yeah, I think investors uh, they wastage is not in the top ten. In the investors, uh, 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 you know, they they still are saying. How much can you make? How much can you sell? How much can you expand? You know, that's that's uh, really. The, but th this is operationally again goes back to uh, how much are you bleeding, right? Uh, you know, as uh, people who run the business, it's extremely important consideration. Uh, but from an investor standpoint, uh, these are hyper local businesses. I know that these are extremely hyper local. The question, I mean, I'm just taking a segue to your question, uh, even though that's not exactly you're asking. For investors, uh, the extremely focused agenda item is: Can you scale? What you are doing, can you do it 10,000 times more, a million times more? Because investors are betting on one guy in that category. So if I'm betting on Rock Cafe as a coffee, can you go and kill Cafe Coffee Day in the online space? So Cafe Coffee Day can still very really well continue to be in the offline, but you are taking a market share away from Cafe Coffee Day, baristas, posters, Starbucks, and you basically are owning this space across India. If not entire India, or do you at least uh, uh, you know, have South India to add to five, six cities? So for them, that's the key consideration. Can it be good to uh, maybe go get some insights for the class as well? And in fact, a lot of the executive MBA guys are in that fourth semester of IDA incubation phase right now. Uh, from an investor perspective, since you've probably met a lot of them with different experience in the past, uh, in this phase, what are the different metrics that they would measure or forecast. So, I mean, if you look at typical e-commerce, it's about, you know, not about making money at all. Right. It's about the yeah. lifetime value, yeah. how many repeat purchases will you have on stamp deal. Yeah. You know, in the traditional food business, it's always that 30% profit. Right? I mean, when you want to set up another subway, are you making 30% profit? So that's not traditional yeah. food business might not work in the online food. What yeah. do you think, in your opinion, for measurement? So, uh, and you're, you're talking about the food tech uh, specifically, right? Yeah, food tech. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I think, uh, first of all, nobody has any consensus, even the investor circle. So, people are uh, solving for different things. Uh, if you look at any of these articles that gets published, uh, now Economic Times, uh, they do uh, an article at least uh, once every three days. The 
big one page article on food just because the flavor of the day everybody wants to uh, read this and uh, every time they uh, change certain metrics sometimes they say number of orders number of orders is one thing consistent uh, sometimes they say number of kitchens number of cities uh, uh, sometimes they talk about uh, 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 number of uh, items that they are selling in their uh, menu so i think uh, the, these metrics are really tactical but one important uh, uh, thing that we have to focus on is is this a scalable model what are the models that you uh, are choosing for uh, your business can it scale to an extent where you we can become the category leader that's basically where investors are really aligned so what scale what is the metric for scale i i met uh, one of the authorities uh, investors uh, who are in this space who already invested in three uh, you know Uh, this guy invested in uh, spoon jar fresh menu and uh, uh, eat flow and he said uh, he doesn't care about orders number of orders he said i don't have any quantitative metrics i invest on qualitative metrics and that that kind of uh, you know uh, it, it, it took uh, us by surprise we were trying to say hey look we really want you on board this is really a nice uh, play for you because you you're going deep in this food thing no beverage no portfolio the proper fits really nice Why don't you tell us what's the number that you want? You're going to come back after a couple of months with that number. He said, "Who who asked you about any number at all? You know, just just tell me uh, why you think you're going to win." And I see certain things that you're already winning in this, and I see there are certain things you still have to solve. Those are the couple of things he told us, and he said, "Just come back after you solve all those things." So it, it's I mean that that guy is probably an exception. It's a, an exception, right? If you go to more uh, established, uh, more uh, number-driven uh, firms, they'll say, "Hey, uh, why don't you show me?" Month on month increase, hundred uh, percent for the next uh, three to four months, and uh, I'll be interested. So it's uh, it's still very much uh, the same uh, metrics that you see in e-commerce. It's not fundamentally different, but there are also the other layer of uh, uh, you know metrics uh, like number of kitchens, uh, number of products on your menu, uh, or uh, people are also talking about uh, how many cities you are in because of the fact that I said uh, you can't uh, be a category leader if you are just uh, in Bangalore. Even though companies already got in the A rounds, and some people are even getting their B round, just to conquer one city, because the idea there is it's not just because to conquer that city, but the fact that you have a Bombay or a SCR or a Bangalore, uh, you know, uh, completely under control, you could really scale up in other cities as well, provided you have solved for the scaling up model. So that's that's where I think uh, uh, people are having uh, their bets. So if I were an investor, I would invest in Bombay. How about that? <laughs> but I think the metrics are not really, you know. But you, I don't know if you kind of thought about what I said. But uh, okay. I, I've heard some metrics from similar investors in this space. I mean, I'm just trying to see if you've heard anything. Yeah, I think uh, people are really, uh, uh, you know, they're skeptical about a couple of things. They're saying uh, this is all good. Um, we're talking about people doing thousand dollars. Thousand dollars a day seems like a huge number. But what the heck are you going to do? Empire in Kolkata does five thousand dollars a day. Nobody talks about them. Just because somebody is doing fresh food is doing five dollars a day, you know, people are saying uh, they they just uh, biggest innovation happened in the human kind. No, it doesn't matter. So please. Yeah, again. Uh, so if you look at Flipkart, they are they made loss uh, for every sale they do. Is it the same case in food tech right now? Like uh, because uh, as in stock to fund. Discounting uh, uh, on investors' money and obviously it's going to run out. And basically, you said uh, this is an easy space to get into. It's not like a flip card or a Uber app. So, what is the future that you see? Just like place yourself really in a pretty nice position. Forgot about the other side of the space. So, customer acquisition is going to be uh, extremely. I think I'm glad you asked this because uh, uh, we didn't talk about it in particular. How you acquire the customer is going to be extremely critical. Uh, there are there are good ways, there are bad ways, there are old ways, there are new ways. But essentially, you got to figure out your own model of customer acquisition. Uh, so, as I said, fundamentally, I still go back to what I said. Uh, in the food uh, uh, business, you got to essentially solve for uh, at least the contribution plus uh, margins right from day one. There is no excuse. If you are not doing it, fundamentally, you don't know how to operate a food business. You know, you are you, because you know that if you put your logistics and your marketing costs, you're going to bleed for a while. So, uh, in terms of what uh, we uh, think uh, is the right model, within 24 months, uh, assuming you're not 
you, you always have to solve for this in phases, right? If I basically say, look, I want to do X amount of orders in Bangalore, and I just want to be in Bangalore, you almost have to do your cash flow modeling and business building as if you're running a lifestyle business. But you're not building a lifestyle business, you're actually taking VC money, that means you got to essentially grow 100% uh, month on month and year on year and all that metrics. But you got to build your cash flow and run your business to meet that cash flow model as if your life depends on it. Then only you're going to basically uh, you know, marry the investor expectations of scaling and also uh, striving a fundamentally profitable business. I think that's where people uh, you know, don't uh, strike the balance. And a lot of times you will see the uh, E-funded uh, companies fail because they still haven't bought up that uh, uh, economically robust model. What if I have 500 million dollar funding in my bank when I spent it all on customer acquisition? Now that, that uh, machine has stopped, I, I have customers uh, leaving me uh, either because my value proposition is not that great that somebody else is not knocking it off and they're doing a better job than me or my business fundamentally even with this scale can make profits. So uh, it's extremely important. So what I understood Three companies that took me earlier, Spoon joined the Rodriguez the quality of Spoon, Dazzo, they have moved from 30 minutes to 45 minutes to 1 hour. Not Spoon, that's the game. No, no, even Dazzo. Oh, yeah. So now they are again. So is this again because you are not able to cope up the model that you have with the money that you have from the, the basically the pressure you have from the investors? Because again, I see because now I am getting feedback from various people. Especially in Spoon Joint Dazzle. Right. They used to be very good. But right. now, for example, Spoon Joint, they are not giving full curry food. Mm -hmm. okay. Similarly, Dazzle, their uh, delivery is going very good. I think it's, it's a combination of uh, the money in the bank but also uh, the way you are uh, building the operating muscle. Right? Swiggy, uh, for example, is suffering because they are not able to onboard the delivery resources at the same place as they are growing. So they're struggling big time. They have they're struggling so much that they basically went back to 60 minutes, which the company's value proposition is shaken now. So they have 14 million dollars in their bank now. I mean, I don't, I don't know how much they've spent, but they basically uh, the news is that they have 14 million dollars funding from Axel and others. Now, even if I have 14 million dollars in the bank, it's not like I can just uh, uh, hire left and right. You know, the little resources. They are paying. They are bringing the market. They're paying 20 or 21 thousand. I mean, everybody else is just waiting and they're not even hiring because next week has whatever they can hire and they will hire later. So sometimes it's not just the back of resources, uh, I mean the money in the bank, it's actually the operating model, are you solving it in the right way or not? Did you make an aggressive promise that you're not able to uh, cope it up because you did not foresee that in six months time when I have this much demand, I'm not uh, going to solve or it. Or is it hold up just getting the money? Uh, I didn't so you have to go, right. it's just a hold. Okay, I have to get money. Yeah, I mean, look, I think if that's the case, uh, that fundamentally, you know, the business uh, uh, has some issues and the investors uh, did not, uh, I mean, I don't think we should not take names, uh, but uh, we don't know. I mean, I think uh, uh, I was a big fan of uh, them till the time they changed the value proposition. And I'll become a fan of them again if they solve for the value proposition and go back uh, to that time because as a company, uh, a rock cafe, we need more people like Swiggy who actually can be that uh, partner. So I'd rather want them to solve for that. Uh, in, in the long term matter, not just uh, uh, you know the short term. Uh, look, I'm going to do this month, I mean, next month. Let's see how it's going to go about. You know, it's not going to work. So, so to some extent, they were aggressive in getting the funds, uh, but uh, uh, you got to face it out. I mean, look, none of these uh, ventures are going to see the exit in a matter of months. Uh, you know, it's, it's it's going to be a long, uh, steady, patient game, right? Uh, it's going to take a few years before uh, uh, you know people see returns. So, yeah, I have. Sure. So, uh, how can you create experience uh, in a food startup platform? Like, uh, there are platforms like uh, Spoonjoy, there are platforms like Shepenza, right, in the market. So, how, 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 what are the parameters which can actually create experience for the customer? Then only you'll be able to pay premium for that, right? Uh, I think, uh, again, wonderful question. Uh, this, is, this all goes back to building the brand, building the customer connect, why you should be different compared to others. Yeah. Uh, so, you want to touch the customer. Uh, definitely with the product, but something beyond the product as well. So you got to essentially feel, make them feel that uh, uh, you 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 care about them. You you essentially it's not it's not a transaction. You're hungry. I have the food. I'm giving you. It's not. It's beyond a transaction. Okay. So uh, the the company 
culture, the company's brand, the company's operations have to be built with uh, those ethos. And you can't just do a, a tactical job of it. I mean, it's everybody in the company should believe it. So uh, some of these things uh, we don't get a chance to talk about, but these are the actually most important things. Um, how do you, if you if you screw up something, how do you actually uh, you know navigate that conversation with the customer? You know, it, a lot of times customers just expect a sorry, right? I mean, you as a startup, you are bound to make mistakes, and the amount of hiring we do. Every day we have uh, a couple of new hires. There's no way we're going to have a GE kind of onboarding process and say, hey, you guys are going to go through this training, and after you're going to go and talk to the customer. So they do mistakes. So we just have to tell customers, look, this is what we are, this is what we do. We understand, you know, uh, mistakes happen. But having that uh, human conversation is extremely important. So you're dealing with the customer not just for the transactional product, but much more. And then uh, that's, that's when people will say, look, I think uh, these guys are, these guys just care about me, and I should care about uh, this business as well. So that should translate into that. And uh, there are a lot of things. Uh, I mean, some companies uh, created uh, brands uh, that became clubs. And the reason for that is, it just, I, I want to be part of this club. I want to embrace this. And that's where the brand gets built. So what are the kind of things that you want uh, customers to feel that I, I'm part of the school club? So I mean, we do, we do some um, simple things, some stupid things, you know, uh, uh, towards this. Uh, you know, we choose uh, our customers on uh, a random basis. We send them mother, uh, Mother's Day gift campers, uh, or we just uh, ask them to uh, uh, give their own recipe, and we try that, and we sell it to the customer. You know, simple, crazy things like that. But you have to engage with the customers. It's not like I'm going to acquire, I'm going to do a bunch of uh, ads on Facebook and Google AdWords, and you come to my page, you just buy the coffee, I deliver it, and you know, calm the company. But you want to essentially say, look, forget about this, but. Can we actually, are there certain other things we can engage with you on? You know, certain common elements. So those are the kind of things uh, which are simply take that relationship to the next level. So, and I will ask you a question. So we're going to end the session. Now we have coffee and tea and then talk outside and talk outside and we'll be around for some time. If you have more questions, uh, you know, you can interact outside. And uh, thank you, thanks for coming. Thank Great you. insights. Thank you.